we're actually going to look at some spiritual laws. And if you've missed the last uh, two, three weeks, or two weeks, sorry, uh, please go get the DVD. Please go get the CD, or you can download it on a memory stick. It's available, I think it's something like 20 Rand or 10 Rand, I'm not quite sure. Um, spiritual laws. So we've been looking at the law, the old covenant, and we've realized that the old covenant, the focus was on what you can do to fulfill the law. And then we learned over the last couple of weeks that no one can fulfill the law. No one but one can fulfill the law. And the focus was on you. And the reason for the law was to say that if you cannot fulfill the law, you needed to cry out to a living God to be saved. The new covenant, friends, the New Testament is far greater, far mightier, and far better. I don't know why, and I've said this in week one, why anyone who is a New Testament Christian, in other words, you believe Jesus is the Son of God and God Himself died on a cross, was buried and was resurrected from death through the Father, through the Spirit, and you believe that in your heart and you're born again, why you would wanna go back to the old covenant? Everything in Jesus is fulfilled. The whole Old Testament is fulfilled. And now we don't live according to the law. If you learned last week, we live according to the Spirit because the law brings a sin consciousness. That's why God gave the law to show man how sinful he was. And from that sin consciousness, we start to think about sinful things. And where there is sin, there is death. But you and I have died through water baptism and rebirth, spiritual rebirth, being born again. We are spiritually born again, new creation and a new creature in Christ Jesus. And we now live according to the Spirit, not the law. So the new covenant, the focus is not on you. The focus is entirely on Jesus and what He did for you. Jesus alone never sinned. Jesus alone fulfilled the law, fulfilled the whole of the old covenant. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Every one of the 10 commandments, He never broke. He fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. Innocently was crucified for your sin, my sin, once and for all, forever, amen. On the cross He said, it is finished. And so it is. And so the focus is on Jesus and your faith in Him is called the Gospel. And if you believe in Him, you are made right before God, not because of your work, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Can I get an amen? amen. Hebrews 10, 16 talks about this new covenant. Also in the book, the Old Testament books, we read about this. I think it's in the book of Joel. Hebrews 10, sorry, Jeremiah. Hebrews 10, 16. This covenant I will make with them after that time. What time? The old covenant, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. The law was there to show mankind they needed a God and a Saviour. Under the law, no one could keep the law. No one but Jesus Christ, Son of God and God Himself. We now live under a new covenant. Romans 7, 6 says, but now we have been released from the law. We've been released from the Lord for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. How did we die to it? That's why baptism is so important. Because by baptism, you are saying the old person dies in those waters. And when I rise up out of those waters, I rise up in the resurrected power of Jesus. It is a symbol of the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. And you are identifying with that act. And as you come out of the water, you say now, I now live not by my own power, but by the resurrected power and Spirit of Jesus. The same Spirit that raised Him from the dead now lives in me. I'm a dead man walking, powered by God's Holy Spirit into a new life.
Now we can serve God, not in the old way, according to the law, in other words, of obeying the letter of the law, but in a new way, by living in the Spirit. And last week we learned that living in the Spirit means to pray without ceasing. It means to meditate upon the Word. It, it, the Old Testament was about getting revelation through a third party, the prophet, the person of God, or the Word itself. But the New Testament is about God living inside of you and to be guided by the Spirit and to live by the Spirit now comes through revelation, through relationship directly to God. And those revelations will never contradict the Word of God, never, never. I told you last week, I think about a, a drug dealer, for lack of a better word, who a pastor went to evangelize him and he had all of his drugs laid out on the floor. And this guy said, before you talk to me about Jesus in the Bible, will you pray with me that God would bless my business today? So that person was not living by the Spirit, but by the flesh. Last week we learned that Christians born again, Holy Spirit filled, blood washed, can flow into the flesh or into the Spirit. And we looked at Peter being a great example. One moment he gets a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. Jesus says, upon this rock, upon this revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then a few sentences later, Jesus says, I'm gonna die, I'm paraphrasing. And Peter says, no, 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 we will not let this happen to you. I will protect you. And Jesus looks at him and says, Puma Satan. It doesn't say it in the English Bible like that. This is the NRV. It's more sanitized. But Puma Satan. Same guy. Same guy. One moment in the spirit, next moment in the flesh. And we gotta to pray to God that we learn, we gotta learn and discipline ourselves to live in the spirit. You, you know what I'm talking about. Hopefully I'm not the only one. When you drive on the road and you see a certain, there's these cars, I won't mention them. They transport many people. I won't tell you what they are, but you can guess, you see the image in your mind's eye. They stop anywhere they want. They are a law unto themselves. Some of them look like they're gonna turn, but they continue straight. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's the <laughs> it looks like they're always turning right, but they still go forward. And I'm amazed at the mechanics of these things. And, and, and I've got to catch myself because I fall into the flesh. Yeah. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and friends, life, the good fight of faith is learning to learn to live in the Spirit and follow God. Today we're gonna look at some spiritual laws. If you have your Bible with me, turn with me to Matthew 5, 17 to 25. Let's get into it. We got about 29 minutes, let's go. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. And we're gonna look at this now now. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, many people that still follow the Old Testament say, you see, Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. Please, and this is what they use as a justification for the Old Testament. But the problem is with all the other scriptures we've been looking at, that does not make sense. The best way to interpret your Bible is to use more scripture. Did you get what I just said? The more I learn about the Bible, the more scripture interprets that scripture. Some people build a whole way of seeing life on one scripture. Please let's look at verses 18. But I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, Jesus is speaking, the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, which by any means will disappear from the law, until, listen, here it is, until everything is accomplished. 
That's exactly what he did on the cross. He accomplished every single thing of the law upon that cross. He fulfilled everything that needed to happen in the law for God not to be angry with mankind, to open up the door that grace and mercy and the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ could be preached across the whole world. The Bible says that until it is accomplished, He accomplished it. On the cross, He said, it is finished. And the veil and the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place where the priest could go and commune with God. He had to go through so many ceremonial laws, so many outer courts to the inner court, to the Holy of Holies. There was a veil in front of the Holy of Holies, a thick curtain cloth. The moment Jesus said, it is finished, that veil supernaturally by the power of God was torn in two that mankind now for the first time could go in and commune with God one to one because of Jesus. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven and whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now we get into some spiritual laws and we're gonna look at some things. For I tell you that unless your, right, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisee and the teacher of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus teaches the following. Verses 21, you have heard it said to people long ago, do not murder. It's one of the commandments. Am I right? Amen. Amen. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. You'll go to a court of law, a human court, and they'll judge you. But I tell you, this is Jesus now, not talking about the law, but telling you about spiritual laws. Watch this. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, you will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, verses 23, if you are offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle the matter quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way. Or he might hand you over to the judge and the judge might hand you over to the officer and you might be thrown into prison. But I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus fulfilled everything in the law. Verse 17, I have come to abolish, I've not come to abolish the law, but fulfill them. Listen to the second thing out of that passage of Scripture. Anyone's righteousness, whose righteousness can surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees? The Pharisees not only had the Ten Commandments, they had something like over 400 different laws. And there were sects within the Pharisees, certain sections That even pushed that up to two to three thousand different laws that man needed to keep to be righteous before God. And Jesus is making a statement here saying, I tell you the truth, verses 20, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisee and the teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Who here today, including me, can surpass the righteousness of those Pharisees? They not only followed the 10 commandments, but the 423 or whatever laws they had, the thousands and thousands of laws. That's why Jesus said to them, when people are struggling, you don't lift their burden, you make it heavier. That's why Jesus says, come to me, all of you that are heavy laden. For my yoke is light and my yoke is easy. Jesus is talking about the law. 
It's talking about that He will carry the burden for you. No one is more righteous than Jesus, not even the Pharisees. The Sanhedrin was the highest spiritual authority of the day. Those are the people that killed Jesus. Because Jesus was opening up a way for mankind to directly speak to God, directly call out onto the Name of God. He was lifting burdens. He was healing the sick. He was feeding the hungry. He was motivating the hopeless and the brokenhearted. He was helping the poor and the weak. And the Sanhedrin hated Him for it because He was pulling away their power, pulling away their spiritual power. And they hated Him for it. They were losing money because people would stop going, would stop going to the temple. And they started to follow Jesus in their masses. And Jesus was a threat to the establishment and He was a threat to the religious order of His day. A religious spirit, friends, here's the lesson. Be very careful that you and I do not fall into a religious spirit because a religious spirit killed people. It killed Jesus. That religious spirit said, we are better than you. Listen to the arrogance of man telling God that they were better than God. We are more righteous than you. And they killed Him for power. I wanna say today, only in Jesus, only in Jesus can you and I make it. Friends, when I read that, that I, I get scared. It makes me wanna fall on my knees and cry out and say, thank you God for Jesus. Thank you that you do not see Basil as Basil, but you see me washed by the blood of the Lamb who was sinless, who was spotless, who never lied, never cheated, never stole, never did anything wrong and He died for me. I thank you God that I am in Christ and I have His righteousness over me. Without Jesus, I won't make it. Without Jesus, I won't survive. Without Jesus, I am lost and I am finished. But in Christ, I have a hope. In Christ, I have life. In Christ, I have eternity. In Him, I have glory and power and love and mercy and grace. In Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Listen to the spiritual laws. Spiritual laws, friends, are much higher than the Old Testament. <laughs> the Old Testament, Jesus says in verses 21, 22, you heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, I'll tell you what that means. He's answerable to the Sanhedrin. So first Jesus starts with a, uh, I'll get to that now. But anyone who says you fool, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell. Look at the progression here. Jesus starts off and says, if you murder, you'll end up in a court and you'll be judged for that act. And that's something you must understand, friends. The law, the law, all law, even man's law, and including the Old Testament law, all the law can ever do, all it can ever do is it can only judge actions. The law can only judge actions. But Jesus goes deeper. Jesus says, I say to you, now this new covenant, I do not look as man looks on actions. I look into your heart. I look at what's happening inside you here. 
That's why the Bible says, guard your heart, for out of your heart, out of your heart, flow the issues of your life. All the things you are struggling with in life, let me help you right now, church. Everything you're struggling with now in life flows out of your heart. Sin issues, hatred issues, whatever, it flows out of your heart. It's things you believe about yourself and you're believing about God incorrectly. That's why we need the Word to bring our hearts in line and to agree with the Spirit. The Spirit is speaking to you day and night and forming you into the image of Christ. We need to start agreeing with Him. Listen to the progression. Jesus starts with an earthly court and then He says, are you angry at your brother? There's a translation that says if we're angry, it's like we, Jesus is saying if you're angry with someone, you'll also be subject to judgment. Now we're going, but I haven't done anything. And Jesus is saying, the Old Testament said, if you kill someone, you're gonna end up in judgment. Now I tell you, if you're angry, you'll end up in judgment. Jesus says in other translations, if you commit adultery, you'll end up in judgment. But Jesus now says, and it's not in this passage, but He says, if you look at a woman and you lust in your heart after her, you've committed adultery. You see spiritual laws are much, much higher, much higher than the law, much higher. Jesus then goes on, He says, if you say raka, what is raka? The word raka means empty one, or if you call someone empty headed. I know you've never done that. Can someone say amen? I sometimes tell my dog, empty headed one, then he looks at me and he still does not understand. So pray for me. And then Jesus says, if you do this, you'll appear in front of a spiritual court. The Sanhedrin were the highest authority of their day. And what's happening is that Jesus is saying, your actions are one thing and an earthly court will judge you. But the more you go deeper into the heart, the judgment starts becoming spiritual. And then he says, if you say fool, you'll end up in the hell's fires. I don't know about you, friends, but I want to cry out to Jesus every day. An earthly judge can only judge your actions, but God looks at your heart. God looks at what really is going on inside of you at a deep level. You see, that's why sometimes we can do good things. In the church, we can sing and praise God. We can even tithe. We can read the Bible. We can do things that look good, but our hearts are so far from God. And that's why sometimes we might do something that looks bad. And notice how we are. We immediately judge that. But then God looks at the person's heart and sees, but through ignorance, maybe they've done something wrong, but their hearts are so close to God. Can you see the New Testament and the New Covenant is far higher, far higher than anything you can find in the Old Testament. And that's why, by the way, God has given you the Holy Spirit to help you the Bible calls him the comforter. The Greek word is the paraclete or the parakletos of God. Now that word means the strengthener, the comforter, the empowerment of God to live the life He's called you to. The strengthener, I like that name. Now when you hear comforter, you think it's The Spirit is speaking and guiding and teaching, never contradicting the Word, never, never. He'll never tell you, after you pray, go sell some heroin quickly, go. Go do it, I bless you, go. Yes, you will make lots of money and you will tithe from that money. Never, never, never. 
the Holy Spirit helped author the Bible. And the Trinity of God, the Bible says God is not a man that He should lie. The Holy Spirit cannot lie. Jesus cannot lie. God cannot lie. And He cannot contradict Himself ever. So one of the ways we also learn about the Spirit is to read the Word. And we listen to the Spirit. Not just based on what we feel, and I'm not talking just about feelings. So many people today in the church base their whole Christian experience on a feeling. Do you know that people have murdered others based on feelings? People leave their husbands and their wives based on feelings? Should feelings now be the judge of your life? Some people live, leave good work, good work, because they don't feel like going to work anymore. Based on feelings. Feelings aren't always correct. Today you're happy, tomorrow you're sad, the day after you're indifferent. But the Word remains true every single day, unchanging. Even though the flower may fade, the Word of the Lord will remain forever, unchanging, unceasing, infallible, the truth of God. James 3.8 talks about you can discipline your body. You can get many things right in your life. And then it says this in James 3.8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And now you read this stuff about raka and fool and empty headed one and empty one and how many of us, including me, have thought these things, have said these things? I wanna say thank you for Jesus. And I wanna pray to God every day that I'm in Jesus because He's my only hope. And let me say this to you because some of you don't maybe struggle with this. Maybe this is not where you're at. Maybe yours is whatever. You can put whatever title and name on it. Anger, drinking, pornography, blah, 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 blah. And you can just carry on. Jesus is the answer to change your heart. The closer you draw to Him and the more you start to trust Him for that need in your life, you will find the answer in Him. Whatever it is. And then watch this, watch this. Here's another spiritual law. Matthew 5, 23 to 25. Therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar, this is talking about someone bringing a gift into the temple, to bring an offering to God. Listen what the Bible says, Jesus says. And therefore remember that your brother has something against you. You haven't even done anything to them. Your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Verses 25, settle the matter quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way. Or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and there you'll be thrown into prison. Verse 26, I'll tell you the truth. You may not get out until every last penny is paid. Here's another spiritual law in the New Testament. Jesus is saying, I want you to be reconciled to everyone you know. As far as you can. See, there are people that might not like you. But as far as you can, you be reconciled to them. Jesus is talking here about forgiveness. That's a spiritual law. Jesus takes it so far. The Old Testament says an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, return whatever they've done to you, return it. But Jesus in the New Testament goes far further. He says, listen, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If someone asks you for your shirt, give them something else. Jesus goes so far, He says, I want you to love your enemies because through that, they will see the love of God in your life. Because by the way, that's the way God loves you. The book of Romans says that we were blasphemers of God 
We, you and I, before we were born again, were blasphemers of God, enemies of God. And the Bible says He still yet loved us by sending His Son to die for us in a state of anonymity with God. You see, friends, when we truly start to understand the gospel, we understand, when I read this, I understand the power of God's grace. I understand that my tongue isn't always saying what I want it to say. I don't always think what I ought to think and I don't always see what I ought to do. And sometimes I don't always do what I need to do. But I wanna stand here today before you and say, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Are you learning something about spiritual laws? It's far higher than the law. And when we start to live like this, the world will see something in us that is so heavenly, so godly, they'll be astounded. I was gonna play a video, I don't feel it's right today. I just sense God wants to do something here today. You know that the early church, friends, many people were converted to the church in the early years while the church was being persecuted, people would pray and bless their enemies while they were being burned at the stake and being fed to the lions. I wanna tell you a story that I heard by Ravi Zacharias that might help you understand this. See, because when we look at it in our natural minds and in our fleshly ways, we think, but we're losing. This is not victory. This is not being more than a conqueror. Ravi Zacharias tells a story of a, a Muslim preacher. They went to a Muslim country and there was a Christian professor in the audience. Uh, I think his name, the, the Muslim preacher was called Amadidat. And um, he, was, he was vilifying Christianity, saying it's foolishness and it's absolute nonsense. And the one Christian professor working in a Muslim country put up his hand and he said, sorry, I totally disagree with you because um, I'm a Christian. And Amadidat, being the man he was, challenged the Christian professor up to the stage. And he says, I will demonstrate to all of you today the foolishness of the Christian faith. And he walked up to the Christian professor and slapped him through the face with one of the almightiest slaps that he could muster. The Christian professor was relaying the story to others and said he was about to faint. His face was burning. And then Amadita said to him, your Bible says you need to turn the other cheek if you're a follower of Christ. He says, but you know what? That's too easy. I'm gonna tell you what your Lord Jesus said. In front of a Muslim audience, he was emboldened and he said to him, Jesus says, if I ask for your shirt, you must give it to me. Or give me more. He says, I want you to take off your pants and give it to me. And the Christian professor, face burning, felt a fool on that stage. Looked at the students sitting in front of him. He says, I apologise for what I'm about to do right now. And he unbuckled his belt and took off his pants and standing on the stage in his underwear was embarrassed handed over the pants to this man and uh, in, in shame, just walked off the stage and Amadidat vilified him, laughed at him, mocked him as he was walking out the hall. I think he went to the bathroom, cleaned up his face, got a pair of pants and he went back to his office totally ashamed. And he said, Lord, we've lost. What looks like a loss to the world is never a loss to God. And he walked to his office, true story. Outside his office was a queue of young people, mostly Muslim, lining up outside of his door. And he walked in and he said, God, I can't do this. Thinking they were there to laugh at him and vilify him. He walked in and he called the first student in. 
the first student fell down at his feet and started crying and said, Sir, I want to apologize for what happened on that stage today. For the first time in my life, I understand the love of God. For the first time in my life, I understand the Christian God. For the first time in my life, I understand there's a God that has mercy and grace and loves me. You see friends, the cross of Jesus looked like failure to the world, but because of it, you and I are seated here. You and I have mercy. You and I have grace. You and I can overcome what seems insurmountable. The new covenant in 